Welcome to Bite at a Time Books Behind the Story, where we answer the questions you have about your favorite classic authors. What inspired your favorite author to write their novels? What was going on in the world at the time? Follow along with us as we tell you what was happening in the world while your favorite authors wrote your favorite classics. My name is Bree Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. If you want to know what's coming next and vote on upcoming books, sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. Be sure to follow my show on your favorite podcast platform so you get all the new episodes. You can find most of our links in the show notes, but also our website, biteatatimebooks.com, includes all of the links for our show, including to our Patreon to support the show and YouTube, where we have special behind the narration of the episodes. We're part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you'd also like to hear a book by the author, check out the Bite at a Time Books podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Today we'll be talking about Mark Twain's biography. Early Life Samuel Langhorn Clemens was born on November 30, 1835, in Florida, Missouri. He was the sixth of seven children of Jane nay Lampton, 1803 to 1890, a native of Kentucky, and John Marshall Clemens, 1798 to 1847, a native of Virginia. His parents met when his father moved to Missouri. They were married in 1823. Twain was of Cornish, English, and Scots-Irish descent. Only three of his siblings survived childhood, Orion, 1825 to 1897, Pamela, 1827 to 1904, and Henry, 1838 to 1858. His brother, Pleasant Hannibal, 1828, died at three weeks of age. His sister, Margaret, 1830 to 1839, when Twain was three, and his brother, Benjamin, 1832 to 1842, three years later. When he was four, Twain's family moved to Hannibal, Missouri a port town on the Mississippi River that inspired the fictional town of St. Petersburg in The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Slavery was legal in Missouri at the time, and it became a theme in these writings. His father was an attorney and judge who died of pneumonia in 1847 when Twain was 11. The following year, Twain left school after the fifth grade to become a printer's apprentice. In 1851, he began working as a typesetter contributing articles and humorous sketches to the Hannibal Journal, a newspaper that Orion owned. When he was 18, he left Hannibal and worked as a printer in New York City, Philadelphia, St. Louis, and Cincinnati, joining the newly formed International Typographical Union, the Printer's Trade Union. He educated himself in public libraries in the evenings, finding wider information than at a conventional school. Twain describes his boyhood in Life on the Mississippi stating that there was but one permanent ambition among his comrades, to be a steamboat man. Pilot was the grandest position of all. The pilot, even in those days of trivial wages, had a princely salary, from $150 to $250 a month, and no board to pay. As Twain described it, the pilot's prestige exceeded that of the captain. The pilot had to get up a warm personal acquaintanceship with every old snag and one-limbed cottonwood and every obscure woodpile that ornaments the banks of this river for 1,200 miles. And more than that must actually know where these things are in the dark. Steamboat pilot Horace E. Bixby took Twain on as a cub pilot to teach him the river between New Orleans and St. Louis for $500, equivalent to $16,000 in 2021, payable out of Twain's first wages after graduating. Twain studied the Mississippi, learning its landmarks, how to navigate its currents effectively, and how to read the river and its constantly shifting channels, reefs, submerged snags, and rocks that would tear the life out of the strongest vessel that ever floated. It was more than two years before he received his pilot's license. Piloting also gave him his pen name from Mark Twain. The leadman's cry for a measured river depth of two fathoms, 12 feet, which was safe water for a steamboat. As a young pilot, Clemens served on the steamer A.B. Chambers with Grant Marsh, who became famous for his exploits as a steamboat captain on the Missouri River. The two liked and admired each other, and maintained a correspondence for many years after Clemens left the river. While training, Samuel convinced his younger brother Henry to work with him, and even arranged a post of mud clerk for him on the steamboat Pennsylvania. 
On June 13, 1858, the steamboat's boiler exploded. Henry succumbed to his wounds on June 21st. Twain claimed to have foreseen this death in a dream a month earlier, which inspired interest in parapsychology. He was an early member of the Society for Psychical Research. Twain was guilt-stricken and held himself responsible for the rest of his life. He continued to work on the river and was a river pilot until the Civil War broke out in 1861, when traffic was curtailed along the Mississippi River. At the start of hostilities, he enlisted briefly in a local Confederate unit. He later wrote the sketch, The Private History of a Campaign That Failed, describing how he and his friends had been Confederate volunteers for two weeks before their unit disbanded. He then left for Nevada to work with his brother Orion, who was secretary of the Nevada Territory. Twain describes the episode in his book, Roughing It. In the American West, Orion became secretary to Nevada Territory Governor James W. Nye in 1861, and Twain joined him when he moved west. The brothers traveled more than two weeks on a stagecoach across the Great Plains and the Rocky Mountains, visiting the Mormon community in Salt Lake City. Twain's journey ended in the silver mining town of Virginia City, Nevada, where he became a miner on the Comstock Lode. He failed as a miner and went to work at the Virginia City newspaper Territorial Enterprise, working under a friend, the writer Dan DeQuill. He first used his pen name here on February 3, 1863, when he wrote a humorous travel account titled Letter from Carson, Re John Goodman, Party at Governor Johnson's Music, and signed it Mark Twain. His experiences in the American West inspired Roughing It, written during 1870-71 to and published in 1872. His experiences in Angel's Camp in Calaveras County, California, provided material for The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County, 1865. Twain moved to San Francisco in 1864, still as a journalist and met writers such as Bret Hart and Artemis Ward. He may have been romantically involved with the poet Ina Coolbreth. His first success as a writer came when his humorous tall tale, The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County, was published on November 18, 1865, in the New York Weekly, The Saturday Press, bringing him national attention. A year later, he traveled to the Sandwich Islands, present-day Hawaii, as a reporter for the Sacramento Union. His letters to the Union were popular and became the basis for his first lectures. In 1867, a local newspaper funded his trip to the Mediterranean aboard the Quaker City, including a tour of Europe in the Middle East. He wrote a collection of travel letters which were later compiled as The Innocents Abroad, 1869, it was on this trip that he met fellow passenger Charles Langdon, who showed him a picture of his sister, Olivia. Twain later claimed to have fallen in love at first sight. Upon returning to the United States, Twain was offered honorary membership in Yale University's secret society, Scroll and Key, in 1868. Marriage and Children Twain and Olivia Langdon corresponded throughout 1868, after she rejected his first marriage proposal, they were married in Elmira, New York, in February 1870, where he courted her and managed to overcome her father's initial reluctance. She came from a wealthy but liberal family. Through her, he met abolitionists, socialists, principled atheists, and activists for women's rights and social equality, including Harriet Beecher Stowe, Frederick Douglass, and utopian socialist writer William Dean Howells, who became a longtime friend. The Clemenses lived in Buffalo, New York from 1869 to 1871. He owned a stake in the Buffalo Express newspaper and worked as an editor and writer. While they were living in Buffalo, their son Langdon died of diphtheria at the age of 19 months. They had three daughters, Susie, 1872 to 1896, Clara, 1874 to 1962, and Jean, 1880 to 1909. The Clemenses formed a friendship with David Gray, who worked as an editor of the rival Buffalo Courier, and his wife Martha. Twain later wrote that the Grays were all the solace he and Livy had during their sorrowful and pathetic brief sojourn in Buffalo, and that Gray's delicate gift for poetry was wasted working for a newspaper. In November 1872, Twain was a passenger on the Cunard Line steamship Batavia, which rescued the nine surviving crew of the British bark Charles Ward. 
Twain witnessed the rescue and wrote to the Royal Humane Society recommending them to honor Batavia's captain and the lifeboat's crew. Starting in 1873, Twain moved his family to Hartford, Connecticut, where he arranged the building of a home next door to Stow. In the 1870s and 1880s, the family summered in Quarry Farm in Elmira, the home of Olivia's sister, Susan Crane. In 1874, Susan had a study built apart from the main house so that Twain would have a quiet place in which to write. Also, he smoked cigars constantly, and Susan did not want him to do so in her house. Twain wrote many of his classic novels during his 17 years in Hartford, 1874 to 1891, and over 20 summers at Quarry Farm. They included The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, 1876, The Prince and the Pauper, 1881, Life on the Mississippi, 1883, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, 1884, and The Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, 1889. The couple's marriage lasted 34 years until Olivia's death in 1904. All of the Clemens family are buried in Elmira's Woodlawn Cemetery. Love of Science and Technology Twain was fascinated with science and scientific inquiry. He developed a close and lasting friendship with Nikola Tesla, and the two spent much time together in Tesla's laboratory. Twain patented three inventions, including an improvement in adjustable and detachable straps for garments, to replace suspenders, and a history trivia game. Most commercially successful was a self-pasting scrapbook. A dried adhesive on the pages needed only to be moistened before use. Over 25,000 were sold. Twain was an early proponent of fingerprinting as a forensic technique, featuring it in a tall tale in Life on the Mississippi, 1883 and as a central plot element in the novel Puddinhead Wilson, 1894. Twain's novel A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, 1889, features a time traveler from the contemporary U.S., using his knowledge of science to introduce modern technology to Arthurian England. This type of historical manipulation became a trope of speculative fiction as alternate histories. In 1909, Thomas Edison visited Twain at Stormfield, his home in Reading, Connecticut, and filmed him. Part of the footage was used in The Prince and the Pauper, 1909, a two-reel short film. It is the only known existing film footage of Twain. Financial Troubles Twain made a substantial amount of money through his writing, but he lost a great deal through investments. He invested mostly in new inventions and technology, particularly the page typesetting machine. It was a beautifully engineered mechanical marvel that amazed viewers when it worked, but it was prone to breakdowns. Twain spent $300,000, equal to $9 million in 2023 on it between 1880 and 1894. But before it could be perfected, it was rendered obsolete by the linotype. He lost the bulk of his book profits as well as a substantial portion of his wife's inheritance. Twain also lost money through his publishing house, Charles L. Webster & Company, which enjoyed initial success selling the memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant but failed soon afterward, losing money on a biography of Pope Leo XIII. Fewer than 200 copies were sold. Twain and his family closed down their expensive Hartford home in response to the dwindling income and moved to Europe in June 1891. William M. Laffin of The New York Sun and the McClure Newspaper Syndicate offered him the publication of a series of six European letters. Twain, Olivia, and their daughter Susie were all faced with health problems and they believed that it would be of benefit to visit European baths. The family stayed mainly in France, Germany, and Italy until May 1895, with longer spells at Berlin, winter 1891-92, to Florence, fall and winter 1892-93, to and Paris, winters and springs 1893-94 to and 1894-95. to during that period, Twain returned four times to New York due to his enduring business troubles. He rented a cheap room in September 1893 at $1.50 per day, equivalent to $45 in 2021, at the Players Club, which he had to keep until March 1894. Meanwhile, he became the belle of New York in the words of biographer Albert Bigelow Payne. Twain's writings and lectures enabled him to recover financially, combined with the help of his friend, Henry Huddleston Rogers. In 1893, he began a friendship with a financier, a principal of Standard Oil, that lasted the remainder of his life. 
Rogers first made him file for bankruptcy in April 1894, then had him transfer the copyrights of his written works to his wife to prevent creditors from gaining possession of them. Finally, Rogers took absolute charge of Twain's money until all his creditors were paid. Twain accepted an offer from Robert Sparrow Smith and embarked on a year-long around-the-world lecture tour in July 1895 to pay off his creditors in full, although he was no longer under any legal obligation to do so. It was a long, arduous journey, and he was sick much of the time mostly from a cold and a carbuncle. The first part of the itinerary took him across northern America to British Columbia, Canada, until the second half of August. For the second part, he sailed across the Pacific Ocean. His scheduled lecture in Honolulu, Hawaii, had to be canceled due to a cholera epidemic. Twain went on to Fiji, Australia, New England, Sri Lanka, India, Mauritius, and South Africa— his three months in India became the centerpiece of his 712-page book, Following the Equator. In the second half of July 1896, he sailed back to England, completing his circumnavigation of the world begun 14 months before. Twain and his family spent four more years in Europe, mainly in England and Austria, October 1897 to May 1899, with longer spells in London and Vienna, Clara had wished to study the piano under Theodore Leschetizky in Vienna. However, Jean's health did not benefit from consulting with specialists in Vienna, the city of doctors. The family moved to London in spring 1899, following a lead by Pulteney Bigelow, who had a good experience being treated by Dr. Jonas Henrik Kellgren, a Swedish osteopathic practitioner in Belgravia. They were persuaded to spend the summer at Kellgren's sanatorium by the lake in the Swedish village of Sanna. Coming back in fall, they continued the treatment in London until Twain was convinced by lengthy inquiries in America that similar osteopathic expertise was available there. In mid-1900, he was the guest of newspaper proprietor Hugh Gilzean Reed at Dollis Hill House, located on the north side of London. Twain wrote that he had never seen any place that was so satisfactorily situated, with its noble trees and stretch of country, and everything that went to make life delightful, and all within a biscuit's throw of the metropolis of the world. He then returned to America in October 1900, having earned enough to pay off his debts. In winter 1900-1901, he became his country's most prominent opponent of imperialism, raising the issue in his speeches, interviews, and writings. In January 1901, he began serving as vice president of the Anti-Imperialistic League of New York. Speaking Engagements Twain was in great demand as a featured speaker, performing solo humorous talks similar to modern stand-up comedy. He gave paid talks to many men's clubs, including the Authors Club, Beefsteak Club, Vagabonds, White Friars, and Monday Evening Club of Hartford. In the late 1890s, he spoke to the Savage Club in London and was elected an honorary member. He was told that only three men had been so honored, including the Prince of Wales, and he replied, Well, it must make the prince feel mighty fine. He visited Melbourne and Sydney in 1895 as part of a world lecture tour. In 1897, he spoke to the Concordia Press Club in Vienna as a special guest, following the diplomat Charlemagne Tower Jr. He delivered the speech, Die Schrecken der Duschen Sprague, the horrors of the German language in German to the great amusement of the audience. In 1901, he was invited to speak at Princeton University's Cleosophic Literary Society, where he was made an honorary member. Canadian Visits in 1881, Twain was honored at a banquet in Montreal, Canada, where he made reference to securing a copyright. In 1883, he paid a brief visit to Ottawa, and he visited Toronto twice in 1884 and 1885 on a reading tour with George Washington Cable, known as the Twins of Genius Tour. The reason for the Toronto visits was to secure Canadian and British copyrights for his upcoming book, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, to which he had alluded in his Montreal visit, the reason for the Ottawa visit had been to secure Canadian and British copyrights for Life on the Mississippi. Publishers in Toronto had printed unauthorized editions of his books at the time, before an international copyright agreement was established in 1891. These were sold in the United States as well as in Canada, depriving him of royalties. He estimated that Belford Brothers' edition of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer alone had cost him $10,000, 
equivalent to 300000 in 2021. He had unsuccessfully attempted to secure the rights for the Prince and the Pauper in 1881, in conjunction with his Montreal trip. Eventually, he received legal advice to register a copyright in Canada, for both Canada and Britain, prior to publishing in the United States, which would restrain the Canadian publishers from printing a version when the American edition was published. There was a requirement that a copyright be registered to a Canadian resident. He addressed this by his short visits to the country. Later Life and Death Twain lived in his later years at 14 West 10th Street in Manhattan. He passed through a period of deep depression which began in 1896 when his daughter Susie died of meningitis. Olivia's death in 1904. And Jean's on December 24, 1909, deepened his gloom. On May 20, 1909, his close friend Henry Rogers died suddenly. In April 1906, he heard that his friend Ina Coolbrith had lost nearly all that she owned in the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, and he volunteered a few autographed portrait photographs to be sold for her benefit. To further aid Coolbrith, George Wharton James visited Twain in New York and arranged for a new portrait session. He was resistant initially, but he eventually admitted that four of the resulting images were the finest ones ever taken of him. In September, Twain started publishing chapters from his autobiography in the North American Review. The same year, Charlotte Teller, a writer living with her grandmother at 3 Fifth Avenue, began an acquaintanceship with him, which lasted several years and may have included romantic intentions on his part. In 1906, Twain formed the Angel First and Aquarium Club for girls who he viewed as surrogate granddaughters. Its dozen or so members ranged in age from 10 to 16. He exchanged letters with his angel fish girls and invited them to concerts in the theater and to play games. Twain wrote in 1909 that the club was his life's chief delight. In 1907, he met Dorothy Quick, aged 11, on a transatlantic crossing, beginning a friendship that was to last until the very day of his death. Twain was awarded an honorary doctor of letters, D.Lit. by Yale University in 1901, then in 1902, the Doctor of Law by the University of Missouri, Oxford University would also award him the Doctorate of Law in 1907. Twain was born two weeks after Halley's Comet's closest approach in 1835. He said in 1809, I came in with Halley's Comet in 1835. It is coming again next year and I expect to go out with it. It will be the greatest disappointment of my life if I don't go out with Halley's Comet. The Almighty has said no doubt. Now here are these two unaccountable freaks. They came in together. They must go out together. Twain's prediction was eerily accurate. He died of a heart attack on April 21, 1910 in Stormfield, one month before the comet passed Earth that year. Upon hearing of Twain's death, President William Howard Taft said, Mark Twain gave pleasure, real intellectual enjoyment to millions, and his works will continue to give such pleasure to millions yet to come. His humor was American, but he was nearly as much appreciated by Englishmen and people of other countries as by his own countrymen. He has made an enduring part of American literature. Twain's funeral was at the Brick Presbyterian Church on Fifth Avenue, New York. He's buried in his wife's family plot at Woodlawn Cemetery in Elmira, New York. The Langdon family plot is marked by a 12-foot monument, Two Fathoms, or Mark Twain, placed there by his surviving daughter Clara, there's also a smaller headstone. He expressed a preference for cremation, for example, in Life on the Mississippi, but he acknowledged that his surviving family would have the last word. Officials in Connecticut and New York estimated the value of Twain's estate at $471,010 million in 2021. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books behind the story today. While we answered some of the questions you have about one of your favorite classic authors, Again, my name is Brie Carlisle, and I hope you come back next time when we answer more questions about one of your favorite classic authors. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. Check out the show notes or our website, biteatatimebooks.com, for the links for our show.